Welcome back to the second part of our engaging episode of Infrastructure Matters, brought to you by IPWA. I'm David Jenkins, and we continue to delve into the world of asset management and its pivotal role in shaping public infrastructure. In this segment, we're delighted to resume our conversation with, with Ashe. Ashe's insights into the first part of our episode provide a compelling look at the importance of strategic asset management and its impact on government infrastructure. Now we're set to explore even further. In this part, we delve into the cross-disciplinary nature of infrastructure management, the integration of natural assets into our strategies and the emerging technologies that are revolutionizing our approach. Ashe will also share his personal motivations, the challenges of navigating political cycles, and his valuable advice for the next generation of infrastructure professionals. This conversation is crucial for anyone interested in understanding how diverse expertise, innovative thinking, and passionate leadership can come together to shape the sustainable and efficient and effective management of our public assets. So stay with us as we continue this insightful journey into the dynamic world of infrastructure asset management, uncovering the strategies that will drive our communities toward a more resilient and sustainable future. So without further ado, let's dive into our second part of the episode with Ashe Babu. So you've, I mean, I'll say this, um, but you know, you've talked about, you've been in infrastructure asset management um, for a long time. You've talked about this philosophy before people even really considered it. You've ha- you've got the insight um, from a global perspective. You've worked with organizations and institutions. You're currently working with the GFO in America. Um, you've worked with other entities. You've been in South Africa. You've you've got this global view and this global perspective of all the things that you've learned in your journey um, and your very significant journey. If you were to give advice now to the federal government on infrastructure what is it that you would be saying i'd be saying that we have spent an extraordinary amount of money in in this country in the world globally whether you look at the u.s new zealand australia canada federal government has pumped a significant amount of money into infrastructure and that money goes into building infrastructure seldom with a 50-year plan that talks about the ongoing maintenance and renewal of that infrastructure. And I'm by no means saying, David, we shouldn't build new infrastructure, but it's about having a plan for the future. So in Australia, for example, to give you two classic um, similarities, in Australia we have a program called Roads to Recovery, which is a fantastic program which allows local government with federal money to target black spots on the road assets uh, where there are there is a high risk or a bridge. And that money often gets inflated or doubled every five to seven years. And that's where I think the federal government needs to have um, some rethinking in relation to a portion of that money getting spent on ensuring that an asset management plan actually drives the spend of that money. Or more importantly, there is some level of capacity built within those remote areas that don't have the asset management skills. Even 5% of the $2 million average that a local government might get spent on building capacity in asset management would go a long way in terms of ensuring that we don't end up with growing the proportion of assets in very poor. Because if that 3% becomes 5%, we've got to throw more money at it in five years' time. The feds have to do that. You look at the US and their IIJA program, the Infrastructure uh, Renewal um, Blitz, of $1.9 trillion, which is targeted at an infrastructure backlog of $11 trillion, only 10% of the actual backlog. And how critical it would be to make sure that that $1.9 trillion is spent in a way that stops that 7% in very poor getting to 10% in very poor. Because when it gets to 10%, the backlog is no longer 11 trillion, it's now 20 trillion. And that's the problem the feds have to really come to come to grips with. And is this a problem that needs, um, and I would argue it would, but you may have a different view, um, is this a problem that needs a cross-sectoral, cross-profession approach? Because you, you're advising and working very closely with the Government Finance Office Association, accountants, typically. Um, 50,000 membership, big strong membership spread across tertiary organisations, local government, um, municipalities, public sector. How can the accountants and the engineers 
work together, and you've done this under the purview of the, the US, but to solve some of these issues, how should they be working together? Great question. So, I mean, look, this has been a, a passion of mine since day one, because really it is at the end of the day a money problem. And you will have a significantly more captured and active audience if you're solving the money problem with a, with a money solution. And a money, so money solution that is based on an asset management practice that says there's multiple ways to spend the billion dollars that we have, for example, and each one of them will give us a different return on investment. And that conversation has to be had with the CFO. My passion in the United States with the GFOA was based on the learnings in Australia where asset management was thought of as an, as an engineering profession. It was the role of the technocrats. Those who built the assets would be best at managing them into the future. Makes perfect sense, except they need money to maintain it. And the, and the people with the money need to see the options. Because if you can't tell me as an engineer how much money I, I need in the next 10 years, and you can't show me what, what you did with what I gave you last five years, I ain't gonna give you more, right? So my passion in the United States is to work more closely with the CFO fraternity, who I believe have a vested interest in the long-term asset management plan. The engineers have the knowledge, the expertise, and the information on how assets perform. Climate scientists are now coming into the equation because we need to know the impact of climate resilience and whether we change tact on both retreat, which is receding, as well as retreat, which is treat the asset with a more resilient treatment like a cool seal or a, or a bushfire resistant composite bridge, for example. All those fraternities are important. And those fraternities in combination is what asset management is. Um, and, and music to my ears when, when IPWEA appointed a chief executive officer who is an accountant. And, and I think even in the US I now find asset management is getting so much momentum because finance professionals are getting interested. Very lately, uh, with uh, Mike Kennedy and Tanya Gerost and uh, Laura Allen uh, and Kyle Wedderberg, Dr. Kyle Wedderberg in the GFOA, we are passionately now promoting natural asset management and bringing accounting standards, hopefully, into accounting for those assets. Because there is a lot of carbon offset that is naturally stored in a tree. And imagine if we could monetize that on a hectare of farm, $50 a year value of carbon offset in one tree uh, would be a phenomenal investment to be traded off in an auction for any organization that needs a carbon offset. And all these opportunities are available if we bring these different fraternities into the, into the game of asset management. And I'm glad you picked up on a natural asset, something that we've been talking about, um, particularly for our members to consider you know, is a natural asset solution as opposed to a grey infrastructure solution. Um, and wh what, but so then that opens it up further, right? Because then the fraternity starts urban foresters, scientists. Correct. But how, from a very practical sense, you've got these different professions, someone's got to lead this. Someone's going to be in a position to, to, to bring everyone on the journey. And how do you see that playing out? Well, that's, that plays out in, in, in different shapes and forms. It's the, the passionate thought leaders would lead it in certain ways with subject matter depth in certain areas. It's not just the climate scientists that can lead this. It's not just the condition assessment champions that can lead this. It's not just the civil engineers or mechanical engineers or accountants. It's got to be a combination. But it's really the thought leaders who are able to bend the politicians to a game-changing way of life where these different disciplines can come together. And that might be a city, or that might be a, a, a health department somewhere. And we've got to look for these thought leaders to bring that collaboration together, which is why I'm, I'm so passionate about bringing international audience to our conferences in the future, where we have panels of these discussions happening. So the 600 attendees that come to the conference go back with the rich, deep, information that they have gleaned. And suddenly it dawns on most people that none of this is really rocket science. Mm. If we can draw on that subject matter expertise from those various domains, 
and we can do it. We can really bring it together, just like we built a vaccine in, in under 12 months. And if, if we were to sit down, and you and me, sit down in, in, let's say, seven years' time, what does the world of infrastructure asset management look like? We've got new technologies. We haven't talked about that a lot, but emerging technologies. We'll have a plethora of, a da- of data that needs, you know, um, we talked about the cross-sectoral approach, different professions, storytelling, bringing people on a journey. What's, what does the world of infrastructure asset management look like in the future? I think we're heading into a space where the assets are going to be self-diagnosing, definitely from a health perspective, where inspectors won't have to go out and inspect 4,000 pumps a year or open the hoods of uh, pit pits, uh, or do road inspections um, every every six months. Um, AI and, and automated technology will provide that information. The future practitioner won't be spending time on, on uh, manipulating data. Uh, they will have options thrown at them at the speed of light uh, to be able to present to the politicians in a very consistent story format. And the politicians will have the levers to push and pull to say, show me what what I get for what I deliver. Mm. I think in the next five to seven years, we'll solve that. Where I'd really like to see this go is the assets also become self-diagnosing in terms of demographic and climate change. I don't think we've quite conquered that yet. For example, there's the, the practice of asset management of replacing like for like. I've got a swimming pool. My asset management plan says in 30 years I've got to replace it. But what if I don't need that swimming pool in that particular demographic area in 10 years' time? That self-diagnosis is probably a step away, and that's something we should be working on to say how do I bring that information in and and make asset management just a decision maker's um, magic. Hmm. Uh, And we're not far from that. You only, I know you've mentioned, you've said this word a number of times just during our conversation. And passionate, and you are, you are absolutely passionate about this. And in fact, you know, you only have to listen to you at certain conferences, and when you speak, you you bring people, you bring people in. What what drives you? What is it that that you know? What what, what will you look back in in 10, 20 years and go? I'm I'm I hand on heart, I am really proud of that. What is what does success look like? And what drives you? For me, success coming from my grandfather's philosophy has been to educate as many people as you can in what you really and truly love. Um, the business that we built was on the back of that. It was, it was, the business wasn't a product. It was 85 really passionate, successful people who came to work not to pay off a mortgage, but to, to do something innovative and, and serve customers. So if I can mentor hundreds and hundreds and maybe thousands of more practitioners over the next 20 years that can, in their own way, start to deliver innovation into this space, that, that would be great success for me. And in terms of, of changes to the environment and how things can be easier, what we talked about short-term political cycles. Does that need to change? Are other things need to change within the institution or institutions that we operate in to be able to um, succeed and, and have greater chance of success when it comes to yeah. infrastructure? So what could you change? What would you change if you could? Yeah. I think we've got to look at that political cycle and time from a relative perspective. A short-term political cycle is measured on the time of the politician's longevity. But if we can be the focal, if we can be the, the, the platform as practitioners that changes a three-year political cycle to a 10-year vision. So the politicians, although they're in there for three years, they're making decisions on a 10-year basis because both morally as well as accountability-wise, they feel responsible to do so. I think that change is in our hands. We can't change the three-year or the four-year cycle to 10 years because that would be disastrous also from a political perspective. Long political cycles are not a great idea. Uh, but how do we do that is, is the community really needs to take this mandate up. And we're seeing that happening in the greener revolution through the teals. Uh, we're seeing that happening through the younger generation that is demanding harder answers 
to question the previous politicians have tried to avoid. So I think that 10 year, 20 year mindset, the impact of climate change and fundamental accountability in how money gets spent is kind of being solved as we, as we speak with the independents as well as the younger generation uh, forcing the, the community to think in that direction. And any community engagement that doesn't include the 12 to the 26 year olds is really a, a weak community engagement because they are the future and they should be designing, defining uh, what their future infrastructure and their, their services will look like. Um, so they, they will make that change. I'm pretty confident that the three year cycle will still be a three year cycle, but the vision will be a 10, 15 year vision. Yeah, okay. I'm, I'm all, I always like asking this question for people that have been very successful. Um, and it, it's the, the answers you get are always fascinating. And um, what, would, what advice would you give your 20 year old person now looking back? <laughs> looking back, uh, I, I would ask the, the 20 year old Ashai to be a lot more calm and collective um, and, and perhaps should have uh, taken a little bit more time to smell the roses along the way maybe watch a few more cricket games uh, and and follow follow um, other passions that I had back then which was um, which was playing cricket um, but other than that I, I don't have a lot of things to look back and, and say I would have liked to change I think destiny has played a great role um, Australia has given me an, an unbelievable opportunity to really follow the passion that I had because we had to do it here for reasons of um, doing more, more and more with less and less. Mm. Um, but I would say be a lot more calm and, um, and um, don't take things too seriously. And what, what's, what, who's helped you on your journey? Um, you said that when you started the business, it was 80 passionate people that wanted to come together, solve a problem, um, and work with customers. But there'll be people along the way. Life is, has its ups and downs. What's, what, or what or who has helped you on your journey? I think my, both my mother and my wife have, have had a phenomenal role. My mother, because she was the one that gave me the mentoring uh, to be a public speaker when I was about five years old. Uh, and my wife had the, the courage to to allow me to get into this profession and passion and uh, really took care of the early stages of the business when you go through those phases of, is this really for us? Mm. Should we give up? And you go on that island literally um, seven times every six months and you feel that's it, this is the end, back off. Mm. Uh, but you need to have that backing. Um, and I think it, after that, if you put those two things together and if you have three or four really good solid people that believe in it, um, I think anything can be achieved. And final question, because there'll be, there'll be some ambitious, young, uh, interested, inspired young asset managers out there that'll, that'll be listening, I know they will. What three bits of advice would you give them? You mentor a lot of young people going, going through their journey, their professional journey. If you were to give them three bits of advice to go away with, what would those three be? For the young practitioners, it's about um, the first bit of advice would be that our job or your job in the future as practitioners is to provide the politicians with the options. It's not to make the decisions. It's the politician's job to make the decisions. So I find a lot of practitioners get despondent and, and feel deflated because the answer that they thought was the right answer wasn't the one that got selected. Mm. And my good friend John Devine from South Australia always says, if there is an option you don't want the politicians to select, don't give them that option. And that's a great way to put it. The first bit of advice is that, which is don't get attached to the outcome, you focus on the options. The second bit of advice for young practitioners is start working if you are if you are working for a company or a council or a, or a government. Don't pick the pick the name of the entity. You need to pick who you work for directly. Your boss. You've got to find one that is able to mentor, and give you the flexibility and the freedom to make the decisions you need to make, uh, and the accountability that comes with it. 
you've got to find that person, not necessarily a company. For young practitioners, the big names are often attractive. But it's sometimes the small ones where you've got a really solid all-round uh, manager, he or she would be able to guide you significantly better. And a third one is, uh, is basically uh, immersing yourself in the, in the subject matter. Uh, don't, don't take shortcuts in the initial stages of your journey. Uh, don't try and overcomplicate something that might be really simple. Um, but whether it's with data, whether it's with writing an asset management plan, whether it's doing a condition audit, um, stick to the, to the fundamentals and spend the time in really understanding how, how that piece of work is, is getting done. And in five years' time, uh, you, you could be uh, an absolutely outstanding asset management practitioner with those three rules. I think that's excellent pieces of advice. So look, um, thank you ever so much, Ashe, for joining us today. Thank you for sharing your insights, being so candid with your thoughts. It's been fascinating. It always is. We always love having a conversation with you. So thank you. Thank you, David. And let's preserve that infrastructure. And that brings us to the end of an incredibly insightful conversation here on Infrastructure Matters. We've journeyed through the complexities of asset management, the innovative future ahead of us, and the interdisciplinary collaboration that's shaping the way which we approach our infrastructure challenges. A huge thank you to Ashe Prabhu for joining us today and sharing such valuable perspectives and personal experiences. For our listeners, we hope this episode has sparked new ideas, provided deeper understanding, and perhaps even inspired some of you to become the future change makers in the world of infrastructure, asset management, public works, and local government engineering. Remember, these discussions are just the beginning. The future of our infrastructure lies in our collective efforts and innovative thinking. So let's continue to collaborate, learn, and grow in this ever-evolving field. Thank you for tuning into Infrastructure Matters by IPWA. Make sure to become a member and join us for our next episode as we continue to explore the fascinating world of public works and infrastructure. Until then, keep building, keep innovating, and keep making a difference in the world we all share.